We coming, and we ain't backing down. We don't need a bunch of cats in here. Yeah, looking in the mirror. Shut up! I'm bitterly disappointed with the officiating today. Guys being dudes. And they run through our <laughs> like through a tin horn, man. Ah, <laughs> wait. Tim Godfrey. Hey. Uh, are, are you going to be able to uh, pay for college for your kids with all the taxes you're about to spend on the new football stadium? <laughs> wow. <laughs> we don't re- we, we usually don't rehearse these openings. That's not where I thought this was going. 26 to 12 by public vote. Congrats. And that's public subsidies with a B billion. And I heard that they're going to ask Godfrey to pay for like 30% of it by himself. Uh, trying to sigh as loudly as I can into this microphone. Yeah, really, really excited. Go go, tighten up, guys. Hey, guys, tighten up. Godfrey, it's kind of funny that they got... Me? It's kind of funny that the Tennessee Titans got this. Because my understanding is that people in Nashville... I mean, I'm not saying they don't care about the Titans. It's right. football and it's Tennessee, but like, yes. they don't care about the Titans like I, in italics. So I can choose. I can choose love or hate here. I can choose the path of light or the path of darkness, and I have to be nice because I live and die with, and also just. I have, I have some breaking news. Put in a pre-order for Sunday ticket. Uh, with a franchise that was accused of the very same things back in the 70s and 80s and all Atlanta sports were. Was it just, hey, they just did it for the, the you know, it was a corporate driven move to have pro franchises in a city where people don't care. And that's, you know, ever since I've been alive, that's made me angry. So I can't say the same thing about Tennessee, but maybe you're not wrong. Godfrey, not the only thing tightening up, by the way. Seems like college football games are going to tighten up at least a little bit. Oh, my. Alex. I'm clapping. I'm clapping. If you hey. if, if if you check out the YouTube version Woo! of this, you'll see me clapping. Richard, well done. Really good. I'm proud of Thank you. Thank you. As never, a parent, prouder. nothing brings you joy like watching a child learn. Thank you. And then implement what they've learned. Wow. Richard, that try. was that was simply great. And, and I'm simply thrilled that it's happened. Oh. Here is the move. So since the late 1960s, college football has stopped the clock on a first down and not rolled it until the ball was set ready for play. This results in a handful of seconds of play clock uh, rolling, but the game clock being stopped after a typical first down that, you know, didn't also involve an out of bounds play though. Of course the clock would stop in that case as well. I'd say what, seven, 12 seconds or so. I assume the rules committee had a more rigorous study of how much time usually is, is stopped on the game clock after these first downs, but that's going away. Uh, This had been different from the NFL. Now it'll be in line with the NFL where the clock rolls unless a player goes out of bounds on the first down, uh, in which case it'll be stopped until it's ready for play. I have not seen any indication that they're getting rid of the out of bounds stoppage uh, until the ball is ready for play. So I think it might be vaguely perceptible in the area where people pay the most attention to it, which is the last two minutes of the half. They're not changing the rule. So you can still have the rapid comeback drive capability that has existed in college football that doesn't in the NFL because the clock will stop on a pass over the middle for 12 yards on, on third and 11. Right. I think it saves probably a few minutes per game. And from the perspective of the rules committee, they are saying that this will mean a couple fewer plays per game, a couple fewer chances to get injured for the players on the field. Also, uh, no more double and triple timeouts usually used to ice a kicker at the end of a half and no untimed downs at the end of the first and third quarter, which you might see once a season for your team. If that's pretty rare, uh, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. We we talked about it a bit when they were previewing this a few months ago. I don't think that game time is a crisis in football the way that it was in baseball until this I year. I do, but that's my point. But I think it's I, good to get ahead of it. I think it's like yeah, kids these days, man. They've been very clear that they think sports are too long. And so I think to the extent you're getting ahead of that and maybe also making the sport like incrementally less of a strain on the people playing it. Great. Sure. Really enjoy you guys saying things like kids these days, the commercial reality. Yeah. I have less of a kids these days thing and more of that Godfrey. Like, I don't think, I don't think a kids these days thing is that big a deal with a sport that's only played once a week. It's a good thing for game length. It's a good thing for, I mean, look, it, it, no one in college football was going to come out and say, there's too many commercials. <laughs> <laughs> this, this whole revenue thing, we don't like it. Um, 
I'm kind of still of two minds about this because it's a faster game. The links of the games, not not the not the time on the field play, but the entire sort of broadcast window or attendance window. I mean, they're getting just incredibly stupid. I mean, like I think the in person experience suffers dramatically, which is how you develop passionate fans. In other words, the the kids, the college kids in the stadium, go on to become twenty and thirty somethings and age into having this whole hog identity like we talk about on our show right we love college football i don't want to just watch my team i want to watch it on television and if you are impacting that experience and ki- and i keep saying kids because i'm fucking methuselah but you don't want people bored with the stadium experience and we're seeing that anecdotally and statistically even in places like alabama and georgia and michigan kids are getting bored and leaving games so i mean i'm, I'm good with that the bad thing and maybe i'll, I'll like i can throw this to you richard is I don't know if this impacts strategy because I'm hesitant to make this a comp to the MLB pitch clock thing, which by the way, I love. I have had so many Braves games on mute to, to my yeah, side I, as I was writing or working. Say, like it's I have really yet nice. To, I've yet to go to a baseball or watch a baseball game this season. Is I've heard I mean, I hear it's that it, big a deal. It, it, it's, it's awesome. Just, it's I breezy. Love it. I and, and honestly, I think combining that pitch clock with I thought eliminating the shift was going to be a bad thing. I love it because it's just, it's more balls in play and it moves, it moves so much quicker. I don't know from a strategy standpoint. And Alex, you mentioned this at the outset of this bit. We're keeping it when tension mounts under two minutes, right? So we're not killing the strategy outright of let's dink and dunk and try to try pick our, pick our way down the field. In my, in my head, I kind of have this like passive viewer watching a Mac game and you don't really have a side to root for, but you want to see a good ending in the fourth quarter before halftime. I think that we're going to maintain that. I think this is just going to speed up the time between starting the quarter of the half and getting to that point. I think you, you could disabuse me of that. If you're, we have a lot of coaches who listen to the show, feel free to tell me so in the DMs or texts, but yeah. I think we're going to be okay. And I think even offensive coordinators are probably okay with us. Some are. I don't expect this to significantly change strategy in the sport. Uh, The one thing that I will say about this, other than that, I also love the pitch clock just as a fan of baseball. I went to a game with my dad last night. It was wonderful. I don't get to go to enough games with my dad anymore. Unfortunately, the pirates blew a five run lead. That wasn't my favorite part of the day, but even though the game like was eight, seven, and it had a lot of winding stuff, we were home by 10 o'clock. It was, mm. And I, I got I got a night's sleep before tonight. Like you were in you were like, back at your house. And in baseball, o'clock? yeah. And in baseball, I'm just a fan. Like here, I'm media, and I don't know if that imperceptibly changes the way that I like view things. Like, oh, you want to get it done because you got to move on to to build a show or do work or something. I don't think so. But I love efforts to keep games a little tidier because while I love sports, I also have things to do, and so do you. I'm imagining the thing about it that I do find that you can point out the hypocrisy of it and be totally right is that the rules committee that put this into effect has not framed it as, all right, let's keep games a little bit shorter. They have framed it as let's limit the number of plays in the games and limit the injury exposures to players. And yes, good. Uh, Obviously, it is also very, very inconsistent to do that at the same time that you're expanding the playoff to 12 teams and opening up the possibility of of 16 game seasons for teams. And not, not the possibility, but in fact you are opening up 16 game seasons for uh, what are still unpaid laborers. And there you get back to how nobody is really in charge of college football. And the people on the rules committee are not the people in the governance board for the playoff. And so the sport gets bigger. And at the same time, they change it to say, ah, well, we want players to play less. It's very silly. And yet in a vacuum. Sure. I mean, it, it is probably good to limit a few plays where you can in this highly commercialized endeavor that is now they, college football. They didn't do, you, do the drastic thing. They didn't do the drastic one to to shave time off the game. I will say that. My other thing is and that would have been incompletions, I, stopping on yes, incompletions. Yes. Yeah. And and I think the like the I, I've made this point in this show before. Like it's it's less a total time thing and more a pacing of the game thing, as far as I'm concerned. If this significantly improves the pacing of the game. Okay. Like I'll think it's good. And and they've, you know, they've done enough. Yeah. My, my point here. And again, this is something that I've said on the show before. If you watch a day of the NFL uh, of college football, and then you watch a day of the NFL, the pacing of the game is night and day. It is night and day 
when you watch college football versus the NFL. And the, obviously the total time of NFL games is, I think, incrementally short. I think NFL's average like just a hair over three or something like that. Yeah, and college is like 322 as of last yeah. year. Yeah. I just yeah. don't want people I don't want people to, to walk away from this conversation in April thinking we're all advocating for less of the thing that we all love and why we're here. It's I really think it's fine tuning quality. Yeah, I this really is an I, I genuinely thing. believe that. I tend to agree. And I think that we're I don't think that the sport is going to be fundamentally changed by this. And I think that that is probably fine. I think this CBS on SEC, SEC on CBS for, you know, the short time that it's alive is still going to be interminable, but maybe when two sort of Texas E air raid teams are playing each other, we chop out a little bit in the middle, which is fine. I think last thing I'll say is I hope that maybe just this year in like a test kitchen situation, the networks learn from this a little bit and, and maybe we stagger games. So if you're sitting on the couch, watching at home, you can sort of move freely through some, some, we don't, we don't know how short they're going to be, if they're going to be shorter, but like, it would be nice to have a better viewing experience. That's away from traditional blocks, like two thirty, six thirty. If that works, I think maybe you start tiering the games a little bit differently. So, so as you sit home all day, you can kind of bounce from moment to moment a little bit better. My one parting thought on this, while I know that they are never going to limit the commercial thing because no. money, 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 uh, replay, man, also replay. And mm. here's here's the first thing that I would do. Automatic reviews on goal line rulings on first or second down, if there's a touchdown, get rid of them. I don't care if it turns out the guy was short by- Wait, uh-uh. Wait, what? No. I, Richard, wow. a, a three-minute review on an, on an automatic triggering review- for a first and goal touchdown where it comes down to whether he was maybe down at the one inch line or he was down at the goal line. It's like, let's keep it moving, man. Like no, they're going to score, they're gonna score on second down. They're going to score I, on second down. They very much might not. Can like, I, that's, how about I pitch yeah, this I, to get I, us then out challenge of here? It, then challenge all right, it. How, how about the, how about I pitch this to get it, to get us out of here? Because we've all been in press boxes. And one thing that I think people might not understand is the, the physical logistics of every stadium and every conference are different. We need a universal set of replay and it probably needs to be in another location so that they like, you know, in the NHL, they go to Toronto and other sports, yeah. they go to New York. That will actually speed things up a lot and it will create a universal standard across the power, whatever. You go um, to you would go to like conference office like ACC goes to Charlotte. And just, I, I would honestly if there if there was again some sort of like and this doesn't happen in college sports a neutral center Chicago New York I don't care like where they have a set of officials I mean this is never going to happen because the, the the conferences do not want to get rid of their own officials but to have a centralized uh, uh, area right now I, people don't realize like it's going up to like a makeshift thing in the press box. Some stadiums press boxes suck. The logistics are different. Like ESPN usually has to wire or CBS or whomever like has to wire all this. Like, let's just get it universal. We're, like we're in a digital age. I think that would help tremendously. Alex, I know your pain on that first down goal, like goal to go re- or any goal to go review and all that. The first time it's obviously wrong and they don't ha- trigger that automatic review. I think people are going to lose their shit. You also know why it's never going to change now more than ever gambling they are fine. never going to change that because of gambling now fine no you're right I, but it's still the change that i want to see in the world uh we'll see how this goes in 2023 house announcements fellas we've got we've got a big one this week but first i want to tell you i mean everything is big really um do want to tell you about our dear friends at home field apparel they are our longest standing podcast business partners as i like to say and uh, I think Godfrey is currently wearing one, one a... Of us, one of us on the show wears a home field... Since we went to video, one of us dresses in the sponsor's clothes every episode, showing off the fine... Sometimes it's called the Profile Eagle or the Side Eagle. This is the first college sports logo that I grew up with. Uh, it was very. It was much more popular in Georgia Southern in the 1970s and 80s. Um, this is one of my favorite home field pieces, and it's on a hoodie. Godfrey, I guarantee you I wear more home field than you because I am more comfortable wearing any team's home field I think stuff. You need to pr- I think you need to prove it, honestly. I, I, that's what it sounds like. That doesn't yesterday, look like yesterday, shirt. yesterday I was walking around Pittsburgh in some Louisville basketball shirt, which is my way of which is my way of signaling my way of signaling that I'm anti-authority and that I don't respect yours. <laughs> or that, that you I, want to bring the big east back. 
Yeah, that's my way of signaling that. Um, you can get that Louisville shirt that I wore. You can get Godfrey's Georgia Southern Digs. You can get Richard's Florida stuff. That's the only stuff he wears because Richard doesn't wear anything non-Florida. Uh, you can get that all at homefieldapparel.com. And with the Cincinnati, promo code, hey, Cincinnati refresh, West Virginia refresh. Boys, you seen that West Virginia refresh? I have. It is very pretty. pretty. Oh, bomber jackets too. Bomber jackets. Uh, bomber, it's, Connor right now is on a bomber jacket kick. I was with him in their warehouse a couple of weeks ago, and he was just – kind of regaling me with ideas about bomber jackets and mock-ups of bomber jackets. And I, I want you to find someone in your life who looks at you the way that Connor right now looks at a bomber jacket. <laughs> I at home cannot game. wait yeah. for that purple silk LSU bomber jacket to show up when I'm at like Christmas Eve mass in Louisiana. Cause it's going to happen. Someone's integrating that into it. Like a dress clothes wardrobe without a doubt, just doing a tie and a shirt and a bomber jacket. I agree. There's no question. If you use the promo code SCD20, you get 20% off your first order at home field. That's SZD20. Thanks very much to home field. Um, fellas, I've been very excited to announce this for a while, and we have a save the date. Uh, Splits on Duo is going on the road. Live shows. It's happening. Uh, we have been wanting to do this for a while, and ahead of our fourth college football season together as a podcast, we are starting our live show calendar on June 15th in Washington, D.C., that is where, that is where I here. live Small town. Uh, in the countries and, of course, the college football capital of the world that is D.C. That's why, um, that's why I tweeted out a Fugazi video. For those of you, I had five SCD listeners figure that out. That's why I was putting Fugazi music out on the feed. We're just we're just doing a tour of small town America, baby. June cl- 15th. Clubs and bars. June 15th. It's going to be an evening show uh, that will open up the doors pretty early. Uh, we have our venue under contract. We are finalizing just a few details but this is a formal save the date. We would love to see you there. We had an amazing crowd when we did a UTSA Troy Cure Bowl watch party in DC back in December, and we what think a, that what a cursed group. We words. think we think that this is uh, is the place to go for our first one, uh, June fifteenth in the evening in DC. This is a save the date. We will have ticketing details and all of that very very soon. We'll blast it out on all of the channels where we blast stuff out, but, including here on this show. But Stephen, but, tell everybody. But that's not all. If you happen to live in the American Midwest, if you happen to live in the American South, no, I can't be any more descriptive of that as we're recording time. Stay (laughs) tuned. Stay tuned. And we're not not going on a world tour. We're not. uh, Spoiler alert. We're doing three shows. (laughs) The other two are coming. Okay. We're coming. We're backing down. If you live in the Midwest or the South, Hang tight if you're thinking, oh, I, I, I want to go to D.C. because they're not coming to the Midwest or the South. Or you want to go to both. Great. We are providing you with as much information as we can as of press time. Don't we don't we all we would love to say that as a bunch of journos. Yeah. Godfrey's so, not Godfrey's not hiding the ball here. It's just it's just really hard to plan events. Just, we're not con- we're not contracts. Event and yeah, yeah, yeah. So Washington, D.C., we got a date. Come see us. I think the Hills in session. All you young staffers, you burgeoning alcoholics. All of you Versioning. political dirt bags in your 20s who are going to shape America's future poorly, I might add. Please come to our show. We June 15th, you. Washington, D.C. It's going to be at a place uh, just steps, actually, from the National Mall. So uh, if you are Hill staff or you are not, I am not. I live in a different part of D.C. Come out June 15th in the evening. Save the date. OK, fellas, let's talk about Deion Sanders. Let's talk about Colorado, because uh, every college football podcast is contractually obligated to talk about Deion at least once a quarter. In the offseason. And we haven't talked about Dion in a bit. So Dion is following through on the thing that he made very, very clear he was going to do the day he took the Colorado job. He is cleaning out this roster, which went one and 11 last year and was not, I guess, to his liking. So he had within a couple of days, within two days of Colorado's spring game, which I think was on Saturday. Yes. Maybe Sunday. Uh, he okay. had Colorado had 18 players in the transfer portal. That's via Max Olson at the athletic who did a great job collecting uh, these numbers. And it boils down to this. I'm going to quote from Max. Colorado had 83 scholarship players at the start of the 2022 season. Only 20 were still on the roster as of Monday night. They are in the forties already. That's the, that's the end of Max's quote. They are in the forties already in transfer departures. Uh, as of Tuesday, the next most in the power five was 29. Uh, and I think that Colorado has had another player or two in the Tuesday, Wednesday time. We are recording this on Wednesday morning, go into the portal as well. So Colorado has lost a ton of players and had a ton of a ton of turnover. And maybe that's fine. Again, they went one and eleven. And that's what Colorado fans are going to point out. They're going to say, or some Colorado fans are going to say, oh, prime series, clean in house. 
they went one and 11. It's a new era, new roster, et cetera. Word of caution. Not every one of these is a guy that he wants to lose. Montana Lamonius Craig, this wide receiver who was really good in their spring game, is going to be a sophomore this year, I believe, uh, was one of their big spring spring game, spring ball stars. He's leaving. He's going to go and play at some really good program. Shader Sanders, Deion Sun, the QB, was antagonizing him on Instagram after he left. Didn't seem happy. Aubrey Smith, a linebacker who apparently really impressed the coaching staff in spring ball this year, 24-7 said that he was one of the few players to get a jersey number, which is sort of an indication that the staff likes you. He's leaving. Yeah, Dion I don't, did a like earn your jersey number thing during spring. He did kind of like that yeah. from the sixties so, impression. I don't know what the overall number of guys is who are leaving it's, Colorado because Dion is flushing the roster and chasing them off. Because there's a lot of that. Godfrey and Richard, you guys will talk about that. But it's not all of them, and some of them are just le- like leaving for greener pastures. And I want to make one point before I kick it to you. Dion Sanders is not for everybody. He's kind of a dick, and his tool of choice is a hammer not a fine tooth comb. And sometimes hammers break things they don't want to break. And I think you're starting to see that the Dion experience, while clearly good for Colorado so far, is not entirely peaches and cream. And it can't be. And it's never going to be. Do you ever comb your hair with a hammer? Yeah, I do. I do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Richard, where do we want to start? I think you you start. I'm going to let you drive. (laughs) Um, Okay. Let's let's start with what you may have seen on Twitter from the he's a tight end who is leaving Colorado and he tweeted that he can't get his practice film. Uh, so let's let's start there. OK, you got a lot of guys leaving. I think it's 30 something since April 15th when just this window opened, obviously more from back in January when the first window opened. Um, Zachary I, I Courtney, shout out. Zachary yes, Courtney. Zach Courtney. Uh, he tweeted yesterday that he can't get his practice film. Um, okay. So some layers here. Um, first and foremost, I I don't think this kid, Zach Courtney has played, so he doesn't have game film. So there is an open exchange from FBS and FC. Like you can get anybody's game film. Everybody can get everybody's game film. Um, all 22 wide and from behind the, the line of scrimmage. So that's not a big deal. What is a big deal? in various ways is practice film. Um, I, I talked to some folks last night and this morning about it. Like overall, the, the, the feedback is it's pretty shitty to block a, a player from getting his practice film. Now I will say this. There's two things that I think I, I get why a coach and a coaching staff may be a little justified from, from, from blocking this. And I do not know about this young man's specific situation to what I'm about to speak to. I talked to one coach last night. who was like, yeah, man, some kid motherfucked us on the practice field on Wednesday of a game week and left. We're probably not going to be that accommodating when he asks for film. Okay. Fair. The other thing is, and I I also think this is fair as far as practice film is concerned. Um, If you sit, uh, Godfrey, you sat with coaches and you've watched film with them. When you watch film on the projector on the screen, it's got, um, it's not just the film. It's got like a a HUD basically on Mm -hmm. the top. That's got like down and distance, period of the practice and, and the play call. Like yes. literally like so the tag. Yeah, you'll see it. It'll look it'll almost look like a URL with spaces in it. It'll be like X pro wing, yeah. single set Y. And so Formation, all, for, yeah. yeah. So and in, by the way, this is even in those air raid offenses that just hold up a number. Like every because it's for internal inventory on right. situations. It also has the defense as well on the bottom, usually. So you know we did this against this and this happened. Right. So so it, so because what I'm about to say is sometimes if you're if a, if a kid is smart as it's told to me a kid will rip his stuff if they have access to it on the ipads um that they're given a kid will rip his stuff before he tells the coach he's going to the portal and make his cut up i love or, it it's like bootleg dvds in Times square or or he will if he's got a good relationship with the video staff after he transfers he'll go to the video staff and be like hey can you help me out or his position coach you know he'd be like hey can you can you help me out and and you'll sit down with your position coach and you'll look through some plays and you'll get 15 to 20 fine or you ask a homeboy to go in and and literally with their iPhone film the film 
that is where you get in trouble because of the cut up, the overlay, all that kind of stuff that has the literal play calls. And look, coach is paranoid, all that kind of stuff. But like, okay, we can't have our real live yeah. play calls out. All right. Let's be adults here. No, um, if anyone, if anyone asks coaches usually don't use television broadcast footage unless they absolutely have to. But in this case, the kid didn't, wasn't even on TV. So it doesn't matter. No. So, so yeah, I, like I, I do not think it's good for business to to block a kid more often than not from getting practice film especially if practice film is all he's got i know that there's another colorado uh young man who has his practice film because he tweeted it so it's not a blanket policy obviously um and and so i don't know specifically what maybe that makes it worse maybe that makes it worse that it's apparently arbitrary yeah I, i don't know what happened with with zach courtney and what happened with that situation yet um but it is it is an interesting thing. I, I do think though that like the, the something is rotten in Denmark thing is like starting there. It's the early going. It's early days. We've been doing this for six months, for four months. It's five months. Well, May. I don't. I I don't want to look. The guy does get if 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 year zero is a thing. The guy who took over the Power Five program that went one on eleven last year does yes. get some kind of version of year zero to be charitable to everybody. Now, uh, Alex doesn't make great points. This team sucked last year. Um, and by the way, they're not going to be good. The, that makes the practice film thing, by the way, to me, even more galling because nobody on the film is going to be on the team next year. It's an old staff. There's going to be 60 new players, uh, at, conservatively, 60 new players on this team. Well, and, and That's also just, what, you're not giving anything to the team. The offense yeah, is yeah. going to be like, like you're going to go from Mike Sanford's offense to Sean Lewis's offense. It's not going to look anything. It, it's going to be totally different. There's, there are no state secrets. Um, As we record this this morning, uh, it is about 9 a.m. God's time on the 26th. Uh, the Athletic, I think it was Oven, dropped a story where they basically just phoned around on a wave of departures. Dion has cut some kids. Now, before everyone freaks out, or if you've already read this story later on as you're driving home and we're, you're processing this, there's one thing I want to say right up front, because I'm also going to talk about a story I just wrote that'll come out this summer for Athlon and it's all anonymously quoted, so you can tell what the tenor and tone will be. Lincoln Riley did this last year. Lincoln Riley, I think, cut ten, nine or ten guys off the roster when he got to USC. I don't want to. It, I, it I, made I, some news. It did. It, it was. It is not. It did not make news the way this is making news. I don't want to. I, I am not disagreeing with you here, Godfrey. I, I, but I do think we have to be clear eyed about. You yes. want to hear? You want to hear how the sausage is made? Yeah. This is how. The sausage is made. So, all right. So I, I'm not saying it's. I'm not where, saying it's an awesome thing for the sport. No, I'm not. I'm not. not guys I, get cut. Guys get I, cut. I wanna, get cut at USC. Guys get cut at FCS. Guys get cut. I want to. I want to give all the benefits of the doubt up front because we're going to have a lot of shit to shovel against Dion here. One of the things I respect about Sanders is that he never hides the negative aspects of this job and he look he's a self-perpetuating brand he's in mm-hmm. he's in the Deion sanders business mm-hmm. and i'll get to the quotes about him in a second from other coaches and all this stuff that is 100 percent true i mm-hmm. will give him credit that he doesn't he doesn't take the blood off the blade he doesn't shy away from the negative aspects of what a college head coach does whereas Remember, like he you, told you he was going to do this yes yes now all that being said Okay, all that being said, I think the more galling part of this is not that, hey, offensive lineman, tight end, whomever, we don't need you, because that is is the nature of the business. Shocking how these guys can't be considered labor or have health care, but they can get fired. It's weird. Um, It's the quote that the quotes that stuck out to me the most were how he never really interacted with these guys at all. Yes. Uh How how Uh uncomfortable the dynamic and the dichotomy was between the new staff's guys and the 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 older roster and that's not just day like i heard a little bit let about me that read last one. night too like go i heard a little go bit go about... ahead and read one alex because i think richard and i are going to do a little note i, I, I want to read one because I, I think that this this was really good reporting uh david ubbin is a really good reporter and we, we know him he's a friend of the show who did this for the athletic he did the work he made he made some phone calls here 
Um, one of them was to the tight end, Zach Courtney, who said, quote, none of the new coaches would talk to the old players and treat us the same as the people they brought in. The new guys wouldn't be picked on as much in film. Coaches would tell them to just do better. But if it was an old player, they'd keep going off on what you did wrong and keep yelling about it. End quote. That's piece of shit behavior. Like, it's uh, sure it's on it. Like, it's it's a it's an upfront way of of doing business. And this is how you this, this is maybe just a more obvious way of getting players off your team that you don't want there. But we don't have to, like, endorse this or sanction it. Like, no, no. it's that not the, it's not nice. That is functionally how you get cut. That is part of the process to getting cut. Like it's a, it's it's a, a lot more high school lunchroom than, yeah. than anybody wants. Different to guy, know. different and guy, that, different guy said, I just want to keep going here. And then I apologize, Richard. I'll, I'll kick it back to you. Different player who was on the way out. This player is Travis Gray, uh, who I think was an offensive lineman on this team. Said that he didn't even have a relationship with Deion Sanders. Never talked to him. Uh, quote, no relationship with him at all. Said what's up to him a few times. I'm not sure he knew the names of half the kids he got rid of, end quote. Also okay. not good, man. Not good. That's, now, now that's pause. functionally how pause. you get cut. I had a quote in the piece I wrote for out. So Athlon, I do the, the coach rumor thing. We talked about it. If you're a patron at splitzoneduo.com, become a patron today. The patrons get to sort of see the assembly of the anonymous scouting reports for all 130-odd FBS teams. I do it every year. I just wrapped up on it. And then Athlon asked me, could you do a feature on Dion that's sort of related to that? I said, look, I'm going to tell you up front. One, Colorado's not going to give us anything. Two, I am not going to do a phoner with like, even if I got it with Dion, where like Dion sat down with some, one of the ESPN.com writers and like, I am not at 42 years old going to transcribe a quote from Dion that says something like, we bring in the juice or some other semantic bullshit that he's put, that he's put out in the media. I, I cannot do it. This is why I don't work in the traditional day-to-day college football media anymore. I want honesty. I know that the apparatus won't deliver it. So I will gladly trade in anonymity to find out what's actually going on. So I did that. And it, what was funny was in the space between the spring game and we, us recording this, I had turned in the draft a while ago. I thought, I always try and balance these things out because when people get anonymous, they get mean. Like we're seeing this in the NFL draft, by the way, right? Every single year. I think everybody who's a football fan knows that all of a sudden anonymous scout season will just be derogatory to some of these players because they can get away with it because there's an ax to grind because there's an agenda. I had a or really no, hard or no time agenda, or they're not, or they're not yeah. drafting a player or whatever, yeah. or they don't really know what they're, they're talking about mm-hmm. or they don't actually have access to the kid or whatever. So I had a hard time finding balance in this and it ends up being kind of like negative 80, 20, I think in, in, in the quotes, I will say, and I don't have the draft in front of me. I had an agent tell me, look, when it comes to sort of like player interaction time, you whatever you can say about Dion and his lack of interaction with his roster or the, the the lack of frequency with which he's in the building in Boulder, you can say the exact same thing about Brian Kelly and Lane Kiffin right now. Again, I'm trying to exercise benefits of the doubt to Dion right now because there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that this is at the very least absent of tact and empathy and compassion for players, but also guys like from a football sense, all the coaches that I spoke with, especially in the PAC 12, like just talk about Colorado for a second. This is an extremely bad football team that is not going to be able to, to sustain the system shock of having every organ retrain transplanted or retransplanted in one cycle of recruiting. This is a one in 11 team that yes. I don't like, like, Hey, look, they're going to come out and score some points. Sean Lewis has, a Maybe. faster, a faster, better scoring offense than Lane Kiffin. Travis defense, Hunter don't block. Their defense is cheesecloth. Okay, <laughs> like this is going to be a bad football team. And the persistent comment that I got was one that we've talked about on this show, Richard. What is Deion Sanders, the media mogul, the YouTube show? I can't talk with him about without having six YouTube cameras on me. All this shit. What is that culture like at one and four? Do you want to play a schedule game right now? You don't even need to. Let me let me spoil it right now. This team might not win an FB or a Power Five game until like close to Halloween. Like Stanford's probably their best shot, and it's not. I think I think it's in mid October. Colorado State might beat them. Okay, so what does all this circus look like? Because he can control every element of narrative. He also had no persistent or aggressive. Be- I'm sorry. My apologies to the Clarion Ledger. It's not your fault. 
Gannett is a fucking ghoul of an organization and an entity and a news a, a news corporation. The Clarion Ledger didn't have the teeth to chase his ass the way a good beat reporter should and could. He's going to be. I'm not saying Colorado is the is Alabama or Ohio State in terms of media coverage, but it might be now because you kept, yeah. you, you kept wave you keep waving the red cape at us, the larger us, not SED. How are you going to hold up to this scrutiny? David, who is a friend and is probably listening to this, like David's basically the Athletics Colorado beat reporter right now. Like, all right. Why do we keep all punishing? Right. Why do they keep punishing this man? They made him a Tennessee beat writer. Oh, there is nice. Before, no, they they put up in Knoxville before Tennessee got good, <laughs> and now he's got to cover. What the heck is Stewart listening to this? What did what did Oven do? <laughs> Jesus, it must I have do. been a highly inappropriate Christmas party. I think there is something to this that people might have lost track of how bad Colorado was last year. Like I have seen, I'm not going to, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, so I'm not going to, but I've seen some commentary that's like, this could be a team that could win. I think I've seen seven. I think I've seen nine. I think, I think I've seen, you got to grow up about that. Like, like in 2023, (laughs) like like, football games. Do you know what this is? My voice can't get any higher. Are you fucking kidding me? This is going to be, in my opinion, this year's version of last year's Arizona, which is you were absolutely terrible. You are still kind of bad and you're probably not good enough to make a bowl game, but you're fun and you score points while giving up a ton of points. That's what I expect the on-field product to look like. Um, The idea that they're going to like contend for the Pac-12 to to anyone who might think that. Or Charles Kelly's going to have an aneurysm with what what they're going to put out there. It's not going to happen. Uh, Two points for me about Dion. Y'all, TCU, Nebraska, Oregon, USC, Arizona. Who are you beating? That's it's, the first five. It's going to be hard. Oregon State is going to beat your ass. This is my thing about, about this whole Dion discussion and why I am just rubbed the wrong way by it. It's I think it's a hypocrisy thing. It's like, yeah, Dion has the right to rapidly flip over a terrible team. And like he said, he was going to do it and he was just being honest and all of that. But like, don't give me the stuff about how this is going to be like some ruthless meritocracy and like the cream is going to rise to the top. And then like it and the, and the QB competition before it's even started, because you want your kid to come with you from an FCS team. And you think he's like absolutely better than anyone you could possibly find to play quarterback. Don't do that. Don't do the he, whole, he did this. At Jackson sorry, State I'm in a sorry to way. interrupt Alex. If Don't he gets do. Injured, if he gets injured, that was brought up several times. If he gets yeah. injured, if Shooter gets injured, they don't have because they anything. didn't because he closed off right. the market to Colorado yes, quarterbacks which, so that he could put his son as a power five quarterback. And, maybe unless there's enough, a late not. portal window, and by the way, unless you're completely bereft of other opportunities, why the fuck would you go to Colorado to back up the coach's son? So everyone competes except for family, I guess. And then the other thing is like, why why am I rubbed so wrong by him being so crude to the players he was trying to chase off the team? It's because in his last job, he pitched himself as this lifter up of young men and of a place. Like Dion wrapped himself in the Jackson State flag, the HBCU flag, the builder of young men flag, like the changer of cultures flag. He wasn't right. just like, oh, I'm going to be a good football coach. He was like, no, I'm going to I'm going to change a place like I'm going to I'm going to help people. And then you treat people like this, like you can do that, but we can say it's bullshit. And I think it is. You know what? And you know what? All this reminds all. me of. It's this is the exact same way. Let's take every element out of this for a second. Ex NFL player, celebrity, the 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 uniqueness and the ubiquity that is Dion. This is the exact same structure of criticism we apply when a late forties white Southern coach <laughs> wraps himself in <laughs> scripture. Yeah, you cannot. Yeah. He's already cannot yeah. always do that. And by the way, Dion, no stranger to the New Testament, uh, you cannot do that and maintain rolling the dice a hundred and you know a hundred odd times on a hundred odd kids every single year. You're going to have either off field incidents. You're going to have legally gray uh, discipline issues. You're going to have disenfranchised kids talk poorly about you. It's never a good tactic. You are never going to be 100% a pious Christian man. And if you use that as a selling point, it's going to be used against you eventually. 
what Dion is doing is constantly and consistently arming his his critics and his opposition with a variety of weapons that they can shoot holes in different aspects of his program. And the reality is he's not, he doesn't have a 10 win roster. It's a bulwark against that. So I'm fascinated to see late November when we're talking about the next recruiting cycle or the next portal cycle, how the culture there is going to reflect the sales pitch he gave when he got it. A couple of things on that. Um, Look, Let's talk about this roster as currently constructed right now. They're at roughly 60-odd um, scholarship players. 85 is the number you want to hit, be at, whatever. Um, I think it's like three defensive linemen on the roster. They got rid of one defensive lineman who I'm told is power five good, another who's probably high level, which would be five good. Um, they, they got rid of players, I think, who can help. I am not concerned about Dion's ability to attract skill talent, to be honest right. with you. Sure. I am concerned about right. how yeah. you win football games, which is blocking and tackling, as I am want to say on this show. Where are the linemen? Well, you're going to play the A11, I guess. As we all know about a football team, the easiest thing to do is develop offensive line chemistry without a spring practice or a truncated spring practice for coming in late. Um, you're coming in, in in the April window. Like I, I that's Richard, where I and look, Richard, Dion before, was, before this week, I had a Pac-12 OC said it's the worst D line in the Power Five. Before and, what you just said happened, and look, Dion was Dion was. I think he said after the game, he was like, "What we look like now is not what we're gonna look like." Da da da. Yes, that's every team in the country, all that kind of stuff. Right. It. I am very interested in in how Dion Sanders triages not just losing i mean getting your ass beat yeah what's tcu gonna do to him getting your ass beat because i'll tell you this we could talk a lot about matt rule and what matt rule is what what, what, what matt rule isn't that nebraska team is gonna be tough that's his home that's his home debut by the way that's why richard's saying this on on september 9th that's his home debut that nebraska team may not win a lot of games this year but you think the Nebraska team that made quarterbacks live in their spring game uh-huh. isn't going to be juiced up to run through your ass? They're going to full back the shit out of them, and they should. Now, I'm not saying that because I want them to lose. I'm saying that if I schematically, if I'm looking I, that, at a yeah, team that's what I would do with yeah, a front yeah. seven like that. Hey, baby. I mean, look at the shirt I'm wearing. Triple that shit. <laughs> like grind those. Actually, that'd be wise for Matt Rule to do from a fundraising <laughs> perspective. If that shit looks like Osborne in Boulder, Colorado, oh my god, fullback and, belly every play. Hear but the this, erection from here. This is my thing, and, and like, look, the, the Alex made this point earlier. The Dion is not for everybody thing. Like, look, the guy's got cameras everywhere. They follow him around everywhere. That is what I've been told. Yeah. Like it, 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 I have been told that what what I've been put in the thing about like, you know player he doesn't know he doesn't have a relationship with some players here's yeah. the other thing about just the football thing i had two people tell me last night they look small as far as watch the spring game they look small physically small yeah definitely like shadur is not a big kid no and that's just and he's work. gonna get banged up by virtue of the system like who's he's the last call he's gonna who's the last contact. colorado quarterback didn't they play four quarterbacks just shr- Do you well, remember, yes who was JT the last Shrout Colorado quarterback you can who like, didn't get crushed of. do you remember seppo lufau a couple years mm-hmm. ago that really good quarterback they had who just got crushed all of who the time. Who is the kid on the 10-win team? That, um... that him. 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 Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah, Steven yeah. Montez. Yeah. Uh, Steven Montez Shinsa. is who, that, Montez is who I was thinking of. Colorado quarterbacks are, are magnets for contact. The strength well, sense coach. Just, <laughs> they just they haven't run the wisest of systems because they've always been on the short end of the stick in terms of what Richard's saying is recruiting and developing line talent. I just, and I'm sure maybe someone, well, they won't do it at Colorado, but maybe someone offline can explain to me they pushed out linemen on both sides in certain degrees. I just, from a body's perspective, I understand you could be the master of the portal. Let's say you're 10 times better than Kiffin. I don't understand how, from a body's perspective, you're not welcoming every lineman on both sides of the ball possible right now. Just just for, it's a war of attrition. I know the Pac-12, I, I, I know it's not Alabama, Georgia uh, every week. I get that, but like it's... There's a level of grind. Look, they have to play, I think, USC and Oregon in succession. They're going to whip their ass. And they're going to grind them, too. By the way, like those teams don't have to be fancy to beat them. They're going to lean. Do you know what? Hey, guys, they play Utah this year. 
Mm. That's a snuff <laughs> film. That's a that should be illegal to watch. I'm sure Kyle Whittingham will call off the dogs. That's a fucking Blumhouse film. I'm sure Kyle Whittingham will will take that week lightly. Thing is, Saturday, Saturday, November 25th. If if you're into weird fucking torture movies, there you go. I think that when they get killed in these games, I think what Dion will do is just try to not focus on that and just talk about yes. other stuff. Like, yeah. re- like remember when you can't preach free agency see, thing is, for twelve people, games, Alex? That you can't, but people might forget this because it doesn't get talked about a lot that Dion went 0 and 2 in the celebration bowl at Jackson state. Mm. And the first time he got his ass absolutely kicked yes. by South Carolina state, which is coached by buddy pew. Who's one of the most respected coaches in division one football, I would say. And he's and the one who said it, that Dion wasn't swag, right? No, no, that no, was that Eddie was Robinson Eddie. at, uh, oh, that's right. That's but right. Eddie Robinson, who is not real. It's Eddie Robinson jr. Who is not the son of, of Eddie Robinson. I'm telling what you, Stephen. What are the what are the odds? It's of incredible. I, it's just ridiculous. Like we have to do something about. It. We have to do something about it. We have to do something about it. Should have like a laminated card on him at all times that explains that that fucking discrepancy. Um, um, I think so I he's, he's got. We'll talk about other stuff. But Alex okay. is making the point. Like it, the, the pivot is going to be raising young men, scripture, yada yada yeah. yada, blah blah blah. I do think, and and I, I was talking to somebody about this last night. That that scripture bit. That stuff plays a little bit differently out there than it does with Grandma in Mississippi. This is one of the most liberal, moneyed. This is one of the most fortified, rich Democratic enclaves in the country. Don't do the Gospels, bro. Just a word of advice from a cracker. Don't play that shit there. It's I do not think gonna work. Dion, like where I do think, and and look, Dion has already s- signaled this. He said. That like something to the effect of like we want quarterbacks from two parent homes and linemen from single parent homes. Like he said that I think during he Super did Bowl. say that he did um, say that. Uh, I like he that one. The, in his opening press conference he said Boulder <laughs> is a place that doesn't have any crime and it has a lot of sunlight and it's beautiful. Like it's just mm. I will I will spare you a conversation I had about the type of. Kids how is this going to over in the black with? community? How, Richard, how, how, when we're not around, how is this being discussed? Golly. I, I, it, yeah, I know. And I'm not asking, I'm not asking you to actually answer that question, but this is an, if you know, you know, moment. That's where another part. We, we will, there, I will tell you, we will have an opportunity to have that discussion on this podcast. Don't worry. We can't give no, out all the good material in April. There's no way this shit is landing in the black community. When when it's just the black community having the conversation, there's no fucking way that this is landing. So it, I, look, yeah. it's going to be year zero. It's going to be year zero ish. That's the Colorado thing for now. Lord knows we will come back around to it at a later date. All right, uh, that's one nightmare this week. The other one uh, ends at the end of <laughs> Thursday night. Uh, the NFL draft fucking finally is upon us. Um, it, this it's... can't be the most annoying year that you've had of the draft. It can't. No, 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 no. Last dude, last year was last year was miserable. Last year was rough because the quarterback sucked. I thought it was fine. No, 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 no. Last I'm talking. I'm, I'm I'm talking about dumb narrative. Oh, I'm whatever. only talking about like the the it gets dumber and dumber and whips itself up and whips itself up and. College doesn't really have a comp to it. I'm sorry. Like going into National Signing Day, you don't have this right. much junk science and bad, honestly, just bad information. Yeah. Um, I, I think this year is l- not as annoying as years past, but it's still pretty bad. Wait till next year with Caleb. Speaking of the quarterback thing, Godfrey, I'm glad you brought that up. We hey. had a qu- our quarterback tier special on Patreon. You can go ahead and go and listen to that. Um, you can listen to that if your team's going to take a quarterback. You can listen to that if your team's not going to take a quarterback. We went pretty deep. Uh, we, we, I think we went like 10 deep on this class. And also did a review, a, a quick review of last year's class as well. That is on our Patreon page. But yeah, th- like this class is a lot, quarterback class, is a lot more interesting than last year's. There are better players. There are more intriguing players. Because of that, that sets the tone for how a draft class just kind of, uh, uh, from a narrative perspective, how a draft class is is actually portrayed um, and, and, and ingested. I think that regular sports fans, dude, regular sports fans do not pay attention to the draft until this week. Now, it, it, you pay attention yeah. to, oh, I would like my team to take XYZ. But I mean, yeah. globally, yeah. the draft class in general this is until where, like I, yeah. today. This is where the teams show the most on a year-round media cycle for the NFL. 
because all the broadcast partners pay the highest premium for NFL content. So they want to drive conversation to their, their shiniest acquisition at ESPN and all the other networks. You also have the NFL network. They've, they've wonderful. We talked about this on the show before. I wish college football would follow suit. They have a wonderful calendar. You know how the NFL is going to like the combine can overtake, uh, you know, college sports that are going on or whatever. We talked about that before. This is where I think the length of the process Mm. It, it almost feels right up into this week before Thursday night, it feels that valid information and good content is actually at its thinnest as you mm-hmm. get closer to the draft because we have microwaved it and microwaved it and microwaved it. And, and some teams not... are smoke screening it. Like some teams no, are I smoke mean, Yeah. My, so my, my team's GM started a press conference, uh, I think it was yesterday, by saying, hi, we're here to tell you as little as possible. <laughs> I love, so, and he, again, I I love transparency. I love honesty in the business. Very funny. I'm fine with that. Tell me up front what your tip, what you want to do. Tell me up front the truth. That's great. Uh, Richard, am I wrong, or is this a really good NFL draft in terms of the caliber of prospect? You mean first round at the top? That's what you mean. What it's even, funny because whenever we talk about like how good or good, like guys, even we deeper. are talking about Thursday night. I am not giving you takes on on many a udfa kind of guy no we're not i'm not going to the udfa waters but i would just point this out from my perspective of like we watch a lot of college football and Mm -hmm. also we all watch the nfl too but like somewhere in the top five you're gonna have bryce young cj stroud and will anderson three absolute studs who played at the highest possible caliber for a college football player to play you might you have not couple- have CJ Stroud in the top five. Oh, that would be weird, but okay. It's, you, I'm so, telling you, this is this is okay. when we talk about smoke screen season. We talk about I, what are Point the Texans going to do? So, like you're oh, hearing right. the Texans, probably something dumb. Yeah, you're hearing the Texans yeah. may take Will Anderson. They may take Tyree Wilson. Uh, the Dude, they couldn't. From- they couldn't. I, I, see, this is okay. This is anyway. what I'm saying. So this point is, is point is, we you have we suddenly sound like a radio show somewhere. <laughs> somewhere uh, you will have those players pick pretty early. Uh, there are some more projectable guys. Like you talk, we've talked a lot on Patreon by Anthony Richardson, uh, Lucas Van Ness from Iowa, who yeah, didn't play a ton, but didn't play a ton in Iowa, but had a ton of sacks. Uh, Good in, prospect. Yeah. Good prospect. Um, but still had a ton of sacks and not that much time, but like even the back half of the first round in some mocks that I've looked at is just insanely good player, insanely good player, insanely good player. I saw a mock by Danny Kelly at the ringer that had from 17th or later, Joey Porter Jr., like awesome cornerback for Rose Bowl winner. Brian Breezy and Miles Murphy, these like high five star, star Clemson defensive linemen. Clemson just chur- eh. has been churning these guys out since what, like the eh. Cleveland Farrell, uh, Christian Wilkins days? I don't want to talk like, about it. Uh, Vic, Vic Beasley. Whatever. I don't want to talk about um, Darnell Wright, who I remember as the only five star that the Good state player. of West Virginia has ever produced. Jackson Smith and Jigba, who the last time we saw him play serious action, was putting up like 800 yards in the Rose Bowl. Jordan Addison, uh, who won a Bolitnikov. Small small. Uh, Addison won a Bolitnikov. Uh, Zay Flowers from BC, who was like buried treasure at BC last year, but was incredible. Know. This is a bit right now. Michael All Mayer, right. the mutant Good. tight yeah. end from Notre You're, Dame. Everybody's overthinking Michael Mayer. You got to uh, off. That Dalton Kincaid, be. the guy from Utah, who we were like, eh, damn. Small. No, okay, but what I'm saying is, uh, if you watch college football, you're like, all these guys are really, really good. Like there aren't okay, a lot of guys. That, but that well, there aren't a lot of guys. So I'm like, hmm, what happened here? Uh, Darnell Washington might not even be a first round pick. Apparently, no. Like, like crazy. Look at that guy. The, Wait, we didn't see, even... So are you lining up that we're about to have a bunch of just a lot of good told you so's from a uh, college maybe. perspective, no, but... or are we? Is, is this like uh, us trying to give uh, sort of overcorrect because we all thought Josh. Well, there was this weird narrative thing where I didn't participate, but like everyone dunked on Josh Allen coming out of college. Like the college media were like, we, "You're evaluating him." Well, there. we were wrong. We were wrong. That's right. what I'm saying. Are we hold on? What, I, I don't. What's wanna, happening here? I don't want to overdo the Josh Allen thing because we've done this before. Josh Allen was not good for three years in the Thank NFL. You. All right, it was not fake. It was not wool pulled over your eyes. It was not something you were. Doing. He couldn't play. All right, he really couldn't play. Motherfucking play um, now. It, he sure as hell can't. Was, wasn't very good at Wyoming. It's just, a fact. Um, just that, a fact. that's what I mean. Coming yeah. out, this is where there is Bill's a disconnect. Mafia by, DM for me. I have his address. Th- this is where there is a disconnect between um, between college people and NFL people. Because when you say Dalton Kincaid, I hear a guy who I know at Utah can play, but then I know from NFL people I talk to that it's the feedback is small. 
Like, it's just like that is it, it is it is in many ways it is in many ways a much more connected game at both levels but there are still many things that make it a different game it, right. it just is well yes yeah, size and speed and the speed, sure, sure. speed at size yes but that's what i'm saying like i don't know that because a lot of these guys were really good in college that and i'm not even saying you're saying this but like i, I don't know that these guys that you just uh, rattled off all all conference all American players are going to be fucking anything in the NFL. They might not be. They might they might not be. I guess what I mean is, we are a college football podcast, and some NFL drafts are more exciting to me as a college football person than others. That's what you mean. Last year's where like I was kind of trying to talk myself into a Liberty quarterback maybe being good like was bleak from Dude, from tight. my from my okay. perspective. He's oh, well, he's. Cow. I mean, we all saw what happened like when he played in games at the end of the year. Um, this year just feels different. They're like Jalen Levis right now. Jalen, yeah, well, Levis is still there, but Jalen Hyatt, who I think just had one of the great college receiving seasons in a long time, probably not a first round pick. Keely Ringo, the guy who picked sixth Bryce Young to bring Georgia back to the promised land and was like a five star recruit who was then just really good for some of the best defenses ever. Apparently, not a first round pick. Uh, Tank Bigsby who is a tank literally and figuratively <laughs> might not be until a day three pick. There's but some see, positional Alex, stuff there. You're, you're doing it. So that I'm, exci- is, I'm saying I'm it. excited for it as there are, I just feels like we are matriculating upward. A lot of really fun college football players this year. Yeah, y'all, are, y'all are actually trying to talk over each other right now. Um, what, and what I mean by that is Alex, you're excited for my favorite word, which is narrative on guys who They're just fun players, right? Who are fun, but maybe bespoke to the game. And what Richard is trying to maybe gently tell you is it you're, the 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 bespoke nature and the, and that fun quality that metric that we strive for like when we it's cover a different game football, it's a different it game always it always 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 hits that brick wall and this it's, is the moment where it look, hits that brick it's wall. a different game uh Zach Wilson is going to be washed out of the NFL in like ten minutes and we all saw what he did uh, <laughs> by the way we had that one right we sure did you see we all did. Guys, we all you guys did. did you know you guys did but I'm not ashamed to admit that even though he had like seventy seconds to throw every pass he was awesome. In 2020, this is awesome. I, Look at I the way the ball threw, just, came out of his hand. Like have, it was amazing. I, I, hang on, I have nil questions in a second because that's to me a more pertinent topic. But this is what I was talking about at the front of the of the deal, where we have this elongated period in the calendar of no live football plus plus the time between declaring combine, um, pro day, and draft. I do, I I watch incredibly smart NFL media microwave brain themselves into overthinking quarterbacks every single year. Go back and listen to the 2021 SCD QB tiers in which we talked about at one yes. point in time the Zach Wilson experiment. Me, Derek, and Ben were pretty dead on what he was and what he wasn't. Right. Um, that's why and, I think that show is so important. That's why Richard does it every year is because three hour block of talk radio on CBS sports radio. If you're like listening on FM, they're going to just barf up whatever names on a board and Hey, do the giants need a quarterback? Let's get it. The reality is the supply is never going to meet the demand in this league. Mm-hmm. And this is the period of time in which college heroes to Alex's point who have fun story. Like, look, if you're the quarterback of this Utah run, like you're fucking Ute legend, in my opinion, like the things they've done, the games where they've been upsets, like that's great. Okay. Problem is, you're still just not gonna translate. But Stephen, I think... second and third contract in the NFL. Richard, I want you to defend me here because, like, oh God. do I have to defend wait, your like, honor? No, I'm trying I'm to not, break peace. I'm not the. Wait, I'm what? not doing the thing where I say any good college football player is going to be good in the NFL. Like, I fully agree with what you express on the Patreon show. Like, I love right. Tendon Hooker at Tennessee. Who didn't? Who doesn't love a guy who can't play at Virginia Tech and then goes to Tennessee? and pilots the most fun offense in the sport and beats Alabama. Who doesn't love that? And yet, I think it's quite silly that we're talking about this, about sure. this possibility yes. that Hendon Hooker could be like a first-round pick. I, I just don't get it. And so I don't do that, and I'm not doing that with Cameron Rising. I'm just being like, you know, there's some pretty great athletes here and pretty great players who uh, seem like they could be had at premium times in, in the NFL draft. And uh, I don't know, hope the Steelers get some of them. Steelers have that Bears pick from the second round that the bears gave them for some reason for chase Claypool. And, you know, if Darnell about, Washington, okay. if Darnell Washington could come to Pittsburgh somewhere in the thirties in, in this draft, I'd be pretty happy. I'll tell you. 
what hold your hold your yinzer thought I'm, again i'm trying to bring you two together to understand that draft can be multiple things for multiple fan bases between pro and college the, the sweet spot is when you get a george pickens right mm. who has an obvious fun unless you're you know a georgia or florida fan or, or an auburn or florida fan or whatever like Pickens pushing dudes off on a scrimmage. Like, Georgia Tech. It, it, yeah, um, like TV. literally like, hey, fuck you, I'm going to hit you in the fucking face, and then I'm going to go catch the ball. Everyone gets that. They get to absorb his identity and celebrate it, and that's the fun part of college football Twitter. And it also translates because the dude goes, I mean, ACL or not, he goes to the Steelers. Like, that's what we all strive for is when we're trying to shake hands with all the NFL dorks at PFF and, you know, when guys like Barnwell reduce it down to numbers, which is their which is their jobs, what we want to do is say, hey, guys, from the much more big tent circus narrative world, and it, it's about eccentricity and it's about that individual identity that we celebrate, here's a we're gonna we're gonna take these guys. Here's a handful of them we think can give you the same person personality and eccentricity at your level because honestly, that's why football's fun. It's not because of a f plus ranking whatever the fuck that, sure. that, that part of, i don't care about that part of what you're getting at is is something that i don't even think is stamped out i don't even want to say is stamped out by the in big air quotes the nfl machine as much as it gets stamped out by, by nfl incompetence which is these guys some of these guys end up who we love what have you they end up going to bad organizations yeah, yeah. not like yeah on bad yeah. teams not being maximized poorly coached yeah and then they wash out like alex i'll yeah. give you an example this is a guy who you actually know fairly well tyson alalu yeah came in at, you know obviously had some injury concerns but came in got injured and dealed for uh, excuse me and played for a crap organization in northern florida about 90 minutes northeast from gainesville then he went to pittsburgh and had a career renaissance so it's here we you go know, it, yeah you know, I... it, it, there 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 are things like that that happen so i say that to say like you know sometimes some of these really good college players who we love you know, we we lose them not even because of their own incompetence or what they can or can't do, but sometimes because they are failed. Uh, that's what, but, but to the Pickens thing, that's why him going to the Steelers, you're like, oh, of course, like awesome. Yeah. You know, he's going to go to a reliable place that's going to develop around his identity and his actual skill set. Richard, uh, we will we'll close out shortly, but I do want to ask you one question uh, because we just talked about some of his receivers and about good college players, probably not getting drafted very high. Stetson Bennett, the most arguably accomplished Georgia Bulldog ever, wild to say, but objectively, I think true, uh, who I hear might oh, be going. Man. Does that mean he's going to run for Senate? Too? Who I hear might be going undrafted uh, and has had character concerns, even though he's white. Uh, <laughs> Alex. What what's the deal? No, here? you can't. I'm sorry. I'm gonna. I'm sorry. White cop here. You, you can't oh, run that shit. bit. You can't run that bit in the same second that, that Johnny Manziel happened. Great bit. Okay, Great but bit. Sorry, okay, dude. Okay. I'm, no, dude. That's okay. more Brooklyn than the dude sitting in Brooklyn right now. I mean, like, maybe, I'm pulling I'm, your fucking card, Stephen. I'm podcasting for Pittsburgh, so I'm allowed to say whatever I want. <laughs> Look, I, I will no say. fucking way you can do the white bit when everyone saw Manziel. Saw it crash land. Okay. Jerry Jones has to well, be physically restrained from drafting him. Godfrey, I'll tell you this. The problem is some of the, in air quotes, character concerns are, uh, there's some hand-holding between Johnny Manziel and Stetson Bennett, if we're going to be honest. Thank you, Richard. Well, no, but the, le I, what I'm saying is the, the league has, the league has responded from, uh, like, like more, more people are systemizing the lessons learned from the Manziel thing. And I think that's why you you saw a very or look. We talked about it offline, pretty early on in this process. We we're like, I mean, that's look. Fullcast never tells a joke. Stetson Bennett Kia <laughs> is a very true statement for a reason, and it was easily identifiable. Bennett. So Georgia is interesting, fascinating here because they have on their football team the two I would say objectively most popular players on their team last year are now going into the draft. One of them is. Absent of positional value, the or at least top five, we can all agree, best player in this draft. I mean, Jalen Carter just is. Yeah. Where he yes. gets picked, we will find out. I know that you want yes. to talk about smoke screening, dude. When Woo. that thing happened at the combine, there was smoke screen that he was going to fall out of the top 10, out of the top 15. 
Yeah. I will believe that when I see it. No, um, I'd take him in Atlanta. I'll believe that when I see it, buddy. If you want to come down the road to Jacksonville, you come on down, yeah, brother. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll we can talk about this out, shit, boss. but when, when we put your fan hat on, you're like, man, nah, I'll roll the yeah, I'll roll yeah, the dice we, on that. We'll figure it out, Hoss. Um, so so there's that. There's that at the top of the draft with his own character concerns. Jalen Carter does have some character concerns. Let's be honest. Um, and then there's Stetson Bennett, who does not have the physical talent to cash the checks that his off season or I guess draft process dalliances have been writing. He yes. erred in not going to the Shrine Bowl and getting a public intoxication charge. Uh, he erred in going to the combine and looking like he would rather be anywhere else in, in a, like a Stetson Bennett needs to impress people or at least not fuck it up at the combine. That's the kind of guy who needs the combine to say to, to, to the feedback from the combine to say, great checks, the box where Hen and hook Hen and hooker leaves the combine and every single team is like, Whoa, that guy impressed us on the whiteboard really impressed us in interviews, all that kind of stuff. People did not say that about sets and Bennett. Um, you know, we understand that I, I, I probably think he'll end up getting drafted fifth, sixth, seventh round pick Saturday, pick, Saturday player. Um, what a waste and we'll see a, what did happens. You say fifth? Did you say fifth? Fifth would be high. Fifth would be high. He's gonna start an NFL game at some point. It's gonna happen. No fucking no. way. I want. No. All right. I don't know let's bet that. on it. Let's Is bet on it. Is there another COVID or something? I let's bet that. on it. But I think six no. six seven round pick. He will absolutely be invited to camp, and then we'll yeah. see what happens when he gets to camp. We'll see. He's gonna if, say really because this is the knock against him right now. The knock is that he is yet to yet to professionalize personally. We will see if in the next four or five months, when he gets into a camp, if he's able to mature and get to a point where, hey, you know, professional football player and he's being a pro. I, but right I'm now, bet. that is the knock. That is what I'm hearing. That is what I hear. I, I talk to people. To that end, I will bet good American money that our that our friend of the program, Cole Kublik, will be interviewing him on the sidelines next February during an XFL game. Okay, disagree, but we'll see. Uh, but part of why I think this this pre-draft period is kind of uniquely harmful for him, and like Godfrey, you can caught me, and I, I'm doing a bit, whatever, fine. But like part of his appeal until it was clear that he was actually really good was like, look at this kind, nice young man with this great handshake who like looks like he could have been the president of any fraternity at UGA. Like he's just this nice young, and I think that this wait, is wait, wait, in some way. No, I know, I, I know what he's talking about. He's talking about the like. He's talking about the like rags to riches, yes. like like walk on like, to starter, like this that perseverance part. and leadership and this character of this young man. But then you and, guys are and, contradicting yourselves at the front so? of this segment because the because the draft doesn't give a shit about narrative. No, 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 no. He's 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 talking about in Stetson's first year starting. He's talking in at Stetson's Georgia? first. Yeah. In Stetson's first oh, year yeah, starting. Yeah, 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 all, yeah, yeah, yeah. All the Masters Polo bros. They like, love that shit. The, the first year starting. That's the identity first, politics. Yeah. The first everyone, year starter and the first representation. national championship had a lot of that. I understand oh, what yeah, else. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's also because they didn't have a, a more athletic quarterback on the roster because, regardless, I can't believe he's a fucking OC. Well, I mean, maybe it's not a Munkin, actually. I'm interrupting myself twice. He's in Baltimore now, but bottom line was that offense was reductive to a point, and he got away with it the previous year because they have a legendary millennial, once in a millennium defense. Yeah. Stetson Bennett worked in that offense because they didn't ask him to do fucking but much. Steven, I just, I just want to be clear about what the difference is between him and Johnny Manziel. All of my bits and jokes aside, Johnny Manziel's thing when he was at A and M was uh, he parties a lot. He is you know, the king of campus, he, he is more of like a wild child. I, I don't know how I would put it. Uh, Stetson Bennett, like doesn't have a smartphone, man. Like that's part of his story. George has made sure to tell that story over you the still, last few years. You could still be drunk and like, without a smartphone. I understand did it for a decade. But you, the identity politics thing, like doesn't not matter. I like these players and their agents present themselves in a certain way. And Look, I, I think, I think of anything uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to run counter to this in Fox news. I just think it's funny that for the first time in history, we went through the well-bred white walk-on Georgia Lily White polo dude wins two national championships. It goes through this process and isn't called well-spoken. Isn't <laughs> it's actually funny the analysis that's coming out through the back channels and the people that we talk to is the motherfucker ain't well-spoken. Well, hey man, Chad Kelly got drafted. 
Okay. Uh, true. <laughs> true. <laughs> there, there, there are moments on the show as we record live where there is a governor that goes off in my head. It says, don't, 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 don't say that. Don't, I don't, absolutely don't do that. said that because we're on video. Not and the Chad Kelly. No, 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 no. I, I'm talking about my response to that response. Um, <laughs> I, I look, I, I, I do get it. He was always going to have an inflated profile because he was coming off of back-to-back national championships with Georgia. I, I guess I'm actually kind of like satisfied with the process because they identified that, hey, he's not an NFL talent because physical reasons, but also prep, maturity, character, culture, this kind of test, that kind of test, whatever. Like I'm, it's refreshing that I'm not hearing, let's say, a Titans fan that I see in, in, at Publix be like, what about Stetson Bennett? Like mm. no one has said something that stupid to me. And Alex, I think 10 years ago, they would have. I really believe that. Where they would have gone like white, well spoken, you know, uh j- gym rat, you know, like all that shit. I really Maybe. do think they would have. So I think I think if anything, it's a sign of slow progress that less people than I expected, even in the state of Georgia where I'm from, get angry about the Stetson Bennett key a bit. Even Georgia fans are like, yeah, probably. Which by the way. Why have an NFL career at all? You could be the, you, dude, like, dude. He'll sell a lot of Kias. You could be fucking governor. Of he'll sell. Like, he'll sell just, a lot of Kias. Those are decent vehicles too. Are they going electric? They must be. Everybody's <laughs> going electric. I don't know. I I, I don't know when he's doing a bit. But he's not as electric killer. as Stetson Bennett yes, was. They have he, Oh god, I'm getting under the. Oh god, he's doing a bit. I gotta go. Uh, fifth and seventh round picks. There's a quick thing, and it's something that I think we're gonna need a couple. Yeah, of years serious journalism is about. nil affecting I, this, Richard. I need to. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not going to say it's not, I'm not going to say it's not, um, you know, I, the Broncos GM, George Payton's the Broncos GM. Yes. He, uh, at the combine, I was standing there. He actually made a mention. He was asked this and, and sort of said this, the, the bottom of the quarterback market is affected edgewise by NIL a little bit in that mm-hmm. guys are saying in school. And I think we saw this in basketball. Like Oscar Shibway, who is the really good Kentucky. Well, I don't know about really good, but the Kentucky. No, he basketball is. Player. He's really okay, good. Okay. He's really good. Yeah. I'm they're going to come, come for you for that. Yeah. The Okay. Okay. The Kentucky basketball player. He was a projected second round pick, as I understand it, last year, but mm-hmm. came back because of NIL money. And like they made him like a Kentucky colonel or some shit. So like, like a lot. Is he there. black? Is he black? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's notable. Um, there's so a lot going on there, but it's happening in basketball too. Um, edgewise players come back to school because we can pay you. So yeah, this is what I'm. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Th- there, there are definitely NFL people who are saying they are seeing this as a developing thing. I would like to see okay. it over a couple of years and make sure it's not just like a one draft class thing or a two draft class thing. Let's see it over the next couple of years, but I don't want to dismiss it out of hand. I do Richard, think there's merit to it. Do we need to, I, I totally agree with you. We always need a data set. There's too many things that are happening in college sports right now where I'm asked for an instant reaction. I say, we need three years. We need to, we, we need cycles. I need to go to people who are smarter than me and say, this is the trend line that we've established. NIL is a great example of this in many ways, but in this specific instance. So my assumption is, Let's say you're, let's say you grade it a six, okay? Your six round draft pick, and you're at a good like helmet logo school in the Power Five guys, right? Like Oklahoma or Georgia, whatever. And they give you the NIL money to stay because you make that roster better, and they're better for it. I assume, and this is kind of me trying to learn out loud. What? How far up can you go in that one year? Like. Are we going to see kids who say, I got a six round grade. I stayed for a little bit of an NIL money. And then I went back out the following year. I still got a six round grade, or maybe I got a fifth round grade. That's what, isn't that what we have to see? Like, in other words, is the value of a six round pick or seventh round pick diminishing because of NIL? Or is it just delaying kids from it's, their inevitable fate as a six round pick? It's probably a delayed. Yeah. Like, because like how know, much better are you going to get relative to the NFL standard? Right. Like, you know, a, a day three pick is a day three pick is a day yeah, three pick. Like you're not maybe, gonna, yeah. maybe you vault up. It happens. Everybody knows it happens. But quarterback like, I get if you if you can get tape. Now, here's here's the thing, though. And it's some of it's a hen and hooker thing or a, a hen and hooker is the clearest example. I also have to see the age thing rinse itself out. I need to see the covid thing rinse itself out. 
because yeah, yeah. and Ben and Derek were really instructed because so Ben and Derek and NFL people I think think a little bit differently about the age thing in general than I do personally but they were to their credit very interesting on our Patreon QB tier show about talking about what the the, the age thing is and and effectively I don't want to give it all away but effectively you know, if you see a 24 year old college football player that makes the leap at age 24, is he really good or is he just way more experienced than the 19 year olds who he is playing against than the 20 year olds who he is playing against? So oh, some okay. of that, yeah. yes, that's kind of their point. So that is, is there, a, is there also a concern for tire tread? Yes, but not as much as the other one. Probably depends on the position. Yes. Like that's the thing. Um, You know, 25 year old running back is a different story, but I like, that that's part of the the rub there that that I think also plays into this. Um, you know, for twenty five and you're in college football still, that is a that is a COVID era thing. We got to rinse that out for this evaluation purposes mm-hmm. to also kind of make this full kind of judgment about what this is. But like I said, I don't think it's nothing to be honest, and I do think there's probably something there because there's definitely something there in basketball. Like if you're a day three pick and a bang on day three pick and you, you know, and, and, and OU is going to give you a hundred K or 75 K to stick around versus the uncertainty of sure. As a practice squad player, you might could make 600, but that doesn't mean you're going to be on the practice. Like you might just get cut. Like yeah. you might get cut in camp. Like, all right. It's- all right. Last question. Same line of logic. Let's put it in reverse for the purposes of ostensibly still being a college football podcast. Does this make good rosters that recruit at like Bud's level, what's it, the blue chip ratio schools? Yeah. Does it make them more more better, for lack of a scientific term, in that they're losing less NFL talent technically every single year? I yeah, assume but then that does, right? Yeah, but the other thing to factor in is grad and regular transfer portal stuff. You also kind yeah, of have to mix yeah, the, the I, I feel like the, too. You would have to isolate the portal, honestly, to figure that yeah. out, probably. Because because yeah. the bottom line is you're, I I don't know. I, I would need someone smarter than me to explain. Is there is there more value in having a returning veteran starter, or is there more value in freeing the spot up to go? I, and I'm talking about again, you're a high tier school. I'm not mm-hmm. talking about a middle of the road six and six AAC school. I assume you would want that incumbent veteran that you've coached and you have consistency with versus one more. Uh, chance to roll the dice in the portal i would assume yeah and there's something to be said for like there's something to be said for your room too where like right if i'm a tight end who's a red shirt freshman can i move up here or are you just gonna bring in somebody and that is the rub of the portal if we want to tie everything to the gate everything today together with maybe the exception of the clock stoppage when i was working on the dion thing and this all connects. I had a coach point something out because he predicted, or maybe he knew that Colorado was going to flush after the spring game or, and also have attrition. He's like, what do you do in the future when you have this amount of turnover and you're trying to install schemes and teach our offense is going to have to become simpler. Our defense is going to have to become simpler because in college you get such a, a, a tiny amount of time to do install to have books right like the whole reason bill c has the whole you know returning starter you know returning experience stuff is that there are some intangible metrics to that too of like well then they know the play calls and they know this and as richard just mentioned the room your linebacker room your quarterback room but if we're rotating in every single year is the shit just gonna have to be simpler out of necessity and and it really comes down to who can teach the most the fastest Mm. just a thought that's our show but before we leave i do want to make one more quick plug a uh, quick plug on the way out uh you have probably heard us reference it a couple of times in the last couple of weeks that we are now on camera as we record this podcast full episodes go up every week on our youtube channel that's youtube.com slash at split zone duo uh, we also now have a much more active instagram channel where we do a lot of stuff we have a TikTok. By the way, that TikTok is not at Split Zone Duo, but it is, it is at SZD Pod because someone squatted the Split Zone Duo handle. If that was you uh, and you want to extort us, please email us podcast at Split Zone with, uh, with the subject line extortion attempt, uh, and we can negotiate over maybe getting that please, handle please, from you. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, please uh, don't do that. 
but no, we would uh, we would love for you to follow those channels. It's a great way to support the show, uh, and we are going to do stuff on those channels that we have we've already started um, with our dear friend Hector Diaz, uh, a brilliant former coworker of ours at SB Nation, who's just a maestro of social videos and of making stuff that people like to consume on the internet. So it's kind of a big business thing for us to get onto these platforms and try to find new listeners. So follow them, tell other people to follow them. Just look us up, Split Zone Duo. We are on Instagram. We're on TikTok. Uh, Alex, we're even on, and we're on YouTube. Alex, Instagram. As we record this, it is now oh, ten ten a.m. April twenty sixth, two thousand two hundred and nine followers on Instagram. I said when we get to five thousand, I would do a wrestling story time Q and A. But I also said I would tell a Hulk Hogan story if you got to twenty five hundred. The deadline is this weekend by the end of the draft. 2,500 mm. followers, you're less than 300 away. If you guys want that content, I'll incorporate it into this show, into the Patreon tiers ultimately. We got to build up the Instagram, guys. I'll talk more about it on the single wing. We are diversifying our internet platforms, not because of any political bent, just because it's good business, and we want y'all to share in us in these communities, share with us in these communities. Thank you. Also, Twitter sucks. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh.